Hello, uh, my name is uh, Sanjay Pujare. I am in Google Cloud Engineering and I am a lead in the GRPC team. Uh, so in this session, I'm going to talk about what GRPC is and some history behind it. Then I'll discuss microservices and service mesh and GRPC's role in that evolution. One of the main stages in the evolution of service mesh is proxy service mesh, and I'll cover that. Then there are a few slides about main tenets of uh, proxy service mesh, uh, traffic management and security. I'll mention XPS and how traffic management and security works in the proxy service mesh with XPS. I'll describe how to use Proxyless GRPC with an example in Java. Then I'll talk about one of the main developments in GRPC, observability and what's happening there. And then we'll end, end with question and answer. So what's GRPC? GRPC was created by Google based on their experience of and the next version of study. Uh, Savvy is the internal RPC framework Google has been using successfully to operate Google scale of microservices. One of the numbers I heard mentioned is uh, something like order of 10 to the power of 10, about 10 billion RPCs per second. Uh, one of the improvements of GRPC over Savvy is use of HTTP2. And the benefits we get are binary framing multiplexing, streaming, and HPAC compression for headers. I'll also talk about protocol buffers in a later slide. Uh, protocol buffer is also known as protobuf, and that's the term I'll, I'll use in the error service presentation. Uh, protobuf is used as the serialization framework with GRPC. So how does one use GRPC? Uh, at a high level, you define your interface using the protobuf IDL in a dot proto file. Uh, dot proto is the extension for such file. I use the proto C compiler to generate client and server stuff. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, protocol buffers is a separate project and the proto C compiler uses a language specific plugin to generate code for a target language. So for example, there is a Java plugin for Proto C and that's how Proto C generates Java code. Uh, so anyway, after the code is generated and stubs are extended or implemented, you can use the client stub uh, to simply make a call to the server. Uh, strictly speaking, GRPC can be used with another serialization framework. Uh, Protobuf is not strictly speaking mandatory, but is the most popular and de facto framework for GRPC. Uh, so what's Protobuf? Uh, Protobuf predates GRPC since Google has been using it with Stubby for quite some time. Uh, as you can see, uh, its advantages are that it is strongly typed, it has a binary format for compactness, and is highly extensible in a backward compatible way. Uh, I had already mentioned the code generator plugins for various GRPC languages like Java, C++, and Go. There are code generators for other languages as well. Uh, I have shown here a sample snippet of Protobuf uh, IDL that shows a struct with string, enum, and int fields. Uh, this slide captures, uh, in a nutshell, why gRPC is so good. Uh, most of these things follow from what I have discussed so far. Now, just a couple of things I would like to add. Uh, GRPC 
is not only used for unary RPCs. Uh, a unary RPC is where you send a single request and get a, a response. But it is also used for the streaming paradigm where uh, you do client streaming or server streaming or bi-directional streaming RPCs. Now, a stream is an unbounded stream of messages. Uh, for using streams, gRPC provides an asynchronous uh, um, framework for processing uh, streams. Um, another thing that I would like to talk about uh, is extensibility and customizability uh, using what we call interceptors. Uh, these interceptors are present both on the client and the server side. Uh, using an interceptor, uh, a client or server can intercept RPCs to dec decorate the calls, or it can perform some cross-cutting functionality such as authentication or authorization or logging. Uh, I'll talk more about uh, using interceptors for logging when uh, we get to observability. Now, this wraps up uh, the introduction to gRPC part of the presentation. In case you want to know more about gRPC, here are the uh, here are some of the links or resources you can look up. Uh, the first one is a link to a very useful presentation uh, covering introduction to gRPC in a previous KubeCon uh, conference. Uh, let's move on to the next section of the presentation. Now, gRPC enables remote procedure calls to make them almost as simple to use as in-process direct calls. Uh, this has enabled the microservice architecture where a monolithic application is broken up into multiple microservices. What used to be in-process communication inside the monolith is now RPCs over the network. Uh, in this picture, the yellow layer talks to the red layer, which talks to the green layer, and these RPCs cross network and infrastructure boundaries. Uh, the Dotted lines in the cloud-like shape show the various boundaries the RPCs have to cross. One advantage of microservice architecture is the ability to scale. Various infrastructure resources, such as VMs, clusters, or networks are added as the application scaling requirements go up. And the RPCs have to be routed or load balanced or secure as part of that scaling up. So how can all this be automated or managed? So this is where the service mesh comes up. A service mesh has a control plane like Istio shown here in the yellow box that is managing the data plane. Uh, that is the bunch of microservices that make up an application. The control plane maintains and manages policies for traffic management and security. These policies are enforced or implemented by data plane entities called proxies. Now, this is the proxy mode. In this picture, uh, gRPC traffic flows through these proxies and the proxies are responsible for routing the traffic and enforcing security based on policies from the control plane. The proxy is transparent. That is, the gRPC application is not aware of their presence and communicates as if the proxies are not present. The proxy is also used for HTTP and other application level traffic, such as Redis or MySQL. Uh, but with gRPC, we can do away with the proxies if we implemented the same functionality uh, in the gRPC layer. So 
this is the so-called proxelist model. Uh, we enhanced GRPC to have the same traffic management and security functionality as the proxy, or specifically the Envoy proxy that is most commonly used in Istio or XCS-based uh, service meshes. Uh, the control plane, uh, Istio in this case, uh, sends the same policies to gRPC instead of the proxy. And the gRPC client and server enforce the policy within the gRPC library. The services in the mesh talk to each other directly without the proxy. Uh, so this is of course true for gRPC traffic, but if you have other kinds of traffic, uh, say HTTP or Redis, then proxies might still be needed uh, in your service mesh. So let's look at the advantages of the proxy service mesh. Uh, in this slide, you can see the latency gains as the result of the proxy mode. Uh, now some background on this experiment setup. Uh, this was set up using Fortio, which is a Go-based load testing app. Uh, the infrastructure resources used are as follows. Uh, a GK cluster version 1.20 with three E2 standard 16 nodes. Uh, these nodes have 16 CPUs and 64 gigabyte memory each. Uh, this experiment uh, uses the Fortio client and server apps in the application container, which has 1.5 virtual CPU and 1000 megabytes memory allocated to it. Uh, then we also have the sidecar container uh, for the Istio agent and the Envoy proxy, which has one virtual CPU and 512 megabytes memory allocated to it. The experiment included uh, uh, both the with and without MPLS enabled modes and with and without the Envoy proxy. Uh, now a little bit about the sidecar container. Uh, if this is proxyless mode, why is there a sidecar container? Uh, note that we did the experiment to measure the performance for both the cases. Uh, in case of proxyless, there is no Envoy proxy but we have the sidecar container for something called an Istio agent. So even though we don't need the Envoy proxy, we need the Istio agent. Now let's compare the performance. Now compared to the Envoy case, there is a massive improvement uh, with MPLS at 64 connections. The latency improvement is from six to 16 times. Uh, that is uh, about 500% to 1500% improvement depending on whether you are looking at a P50 or P99 latency numbers. Uh, note that uh, this still supports advanced traffic management and MPLS, but without the Envoy proxy. Uh, let's also look at the resource usage. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the proxyless experiment still requires an agent called the Istio agent. Uh, even if we still require an Istio agent, the agent uses less than 0.1% of the full uh, vCPU and only 25 megabytes of memory, which is less than half of what uh, Envoy requires. Note that these metrics don't include the additional resource usage by gRPC in the application container, uh, but this serves to demonstrate the resource usage impact of the Istio agent when running uh, in this mode. Uh, I think I had mentioned XTS before, so let me expand on that a little bit. XTS is a protocol for control plane to talk to uh, the data plane entities. That's why it's called a data plane API XTS. Uh, now XTS, where X stands for some data plane entity like X in algebra, and DS is discovery service. Uh, for example, CDS for discovery of clusters, RDS for routes, LDS for listeners, and so on. Uh, XTS was developed for Envoy, but is pretty open 
an action server for any kind of uh, service mesh. gRPC adopted it and extended it for the proximal service mesh. Uh, this slide mainly shows how uh, HPS works for traffic management in the service mesh. The LDS, uh, which is the listener discovery service, is used to discover the configuration route for any gRPC service uh, a client is trying to reach, uh, such as payment-service.mydomain.com. Uh, LDS is the root of the configuration, and it points to other artifacts, specifically RDS uh, for routes. Now, RDS contains the routing information, things such as how to process the host path and other HTTP headers to route a request. So this is the place where routing and traffic policies are enforced. Uh, RDS further points to CDS. CDS has cluster information. A cluster is a set of backends that are part of the same infrastructure, such as the same geography or the same network. And the all the backends in the cluster share the same security configuration, such as certificate and key. Now CDS has uh, references to what is called EDS, Endpoint Discovery Service. EDS has the actual backends that a client connects to. So CDS and EDS together are used for load balancing. Uh, having covered uh, traffic management, uh, let's look at security. So why is security so important in, in a service mesh? Uh, remember that a service mesh is the result of uh, breaking up a monolithic application. What used to be in-process communication inside the monolith is now RPC over the network. And as a result, they need to be secure. These RPCs are routed or load balanced as part of the service mesh orchestration. Uh, we need security uh, that's well integrated with things like uh, routing, load balancing, and service discovery. For example, uh, each endpoint needs to be able to validate its PL certificate and identity using the control plane provided information. Security also includes authorization where a server authorizes a client before accepting the RPCs. So how is all this done and who does it? The answer is service mesh with security. Uh, this is a diagrammatic representation of how it all works. You have the client in the yellow box on the left sending RPCs uh, to the server in the red box over a secure channel. The blue lock on that line indicates a secure channel. Both client and server are XPS enabled and get their security configuration from the XPS control plane shown in blue at the top. The client and server need certificates and keys that are, are provided by the certificate and deployment infrastructure to make it all happen. The green box uh, represents the various infrastructure components, uh, which include certification authorities, also known as CAs, uh, to mint certificates, a process to continuously generate CSRs and use them to mint the certificates, a mechanism to make these certificates and keys available to gRPC workloads using the gRPC plugin feature. Now, for implementing security, uh, we implemented a certificate plugin feature in gRPC. And we also added the required extension points uh, for the plugins uh, in XPS. When all of these things are in place, the client and server secure their gRPC traffic. Let's recap uh, service mesh security. Uh, the control plane uses a transport socket abstraction within a CDS or a DS to configure security in gRPC. 
uh, but there are external components like the security infrastructure to provide certificates and keys. When MTLS is involved, gRPC uses the provided certificates and certain other bits from the transport socket configuration to create the MTLS configuration uh, or to create MTLS connection. We get authentication, encryption, and something called server authorization with MTLS. Uh, server authorization is somewhat like the host name check in HTTP TLS. Uh, then as part of security, we also have a regular authorization or client authorization uh, implemented on the server side where a user can use authorization policies also known as RBAC to authorize RPCs based on various things, including client identities. Uh, so how does one use this stuff, say in Java? The example in this slide is from the security GRLC mentioned here, a 29 xps tls securitymd Now a GRLC is an RFC or a proposal in the RP GRPC ecosystem. Uh, this example is in Java, but the usage in C++ and Python and Go is similar. Uh, there is something called XPS channel credential and that is supplied to your channel builder. And this credential tells GRPC to use XPS supplied security configuration. Uh, there is something called uh, server credential uh, on the server side. Uh, which instructs GRPC to use XPS supplied security configuration on the server side. And I wonder what the insecure channel credentials used inside Create is doing. Uh, this is a fallback credential. Uh, and what is that? Uh, I will come to that uh, in a bit. Now that uh, XPS channel credential is, uh, uh, not that the XPS channel credential is a way for a caller to obtain the use of XPS security config. Note that a caller can use a different credential, uh, for example, a TLS credential with a channel in which case the XPS supplied security config is ignored even if uh, the rest of the configuration from XPS is used. Uh, now back to fallback credential. An XPS credential also takes something called a fallback credential, which kicks in if XPS doesn't supply any security configuration. Uh, so instead of choosing this, uh, uh, choosing to treat this as a plain text or insecure communication, a caller can tell GRPC to use fallback TLS credential uh, if they had used TLS credential in, in this particular uh, uh, XPS credentials. Uh, this wraps up the uh, GRPC and service mesh part of the presentation. Uh, for more information, you can look up a previous KubeCon presentation that uh, talks about uh, proxy-based GRPC service mesh in some detail. I have also included another KubeCon presentation last year uh, that focused on uh, security in proxy-based service mesh. Uh, both of these talk about using the proxy-based GRPC service mesh in Google Cloud using Google service mesh products. Uh, I have also included an Istio blog that talks about proxy service mesh in Istio. Uh, now let's look at uh, another aspect of microservices or the service mesh where effective use of this paradigm could be hampered by what we call observability or lack of it. Uh, observability in simple words is visibility into the internal goings on in your service mesh uh, to the extent that you need that visibility for reli reliability and efficiency. For example, if something breaks in your uh, complex service mesh or it is performing poorly, how do you figure out where the problem is? Uh, is there any way the infrastructure or the software components can provide that required visibility. So let's talk about 
GRTC observability and have that come into play here. Uh, we in the GRTC team uh, are about to release GRTC observability, which consists of logs, metrics, and three sets. The three main uh, pillars of observability. Uh, I had talked about uh, GRTC interceptors before. Uh, we use the GRTC interceptor framework to inject our observability interceptors, which generate the required raw data for the three pillars. This part is then integrated with exporters and backends so that the raw data is massaged and sent through the exporter pipeline to an appropriate analytics backend. Uh, this integration provides the end-to-end -end GRPC observability. Uh, some more information about GRPC observability or O11Y as we like to call it. Uh, you have the app developer, uh, the character, uh, the icon on the left, left hand side in green. Uh, the app developer is building GRPC applications using the latest GRPC artifacts that support observability. The running apps are provided with appropriate uh, observability configuration by the developer or the SRE. The GRPC interceptors uh, pump the relevant raw data, uh, mainly logs, metrics, and trace information uh, through the related exporters into the respective backends. Uh, here you see a logging backend, a metrics backend, and a trace backend. These backends then produce the required dashboards that are used by the consumer. In this case, the SRE uh, uh, to get the visibility into the internal state of the application, specifically as it is related to GRPC traffic. The GRPC observability product runs in Google Cloud uh, platform. On the producer side, it has plugins for logging, metrics, and traces. On the producer side, you also include the required exporters in the application, namely the stack driver exporters configured to send data to the Google Cloud Ops backend. The product also has an admin console to enable or otherwise administer the feature. And then we have consumer dashboards that provide some popular canned views or allow you to configure or customize the views uh, with customizable queries. Uh, let's see how all this works in Java. Uh, in Java, there is an artifact called GRPC GCP observability that you use in your application. The artifact also pulls in other required dependencies such as the uh, stack driver exporter. Uh, in your Java app, you call an init function at the beginning. Uh, when the application is run in GCP and an appropriate configuration is provided, it automatically sends the required raw data to the Google Cloud Ops backend, and you have observability. <clears throat> Let's look at the Java code snippet for an actual example. In your main application uh, class, there is a main method uh, you call GCP observability.grpc init to start observability. In this case, we are using try with resources. So when the try block exists, close is also is automatically called. The whole application execution is inside the try block. Uh, now you may choose to call close explicitly if you don't want to use try with resources. Uh, this is what the GRPC observability configuration looks like. Uh, there are enable disable flags for the three pillars. For logging, there are filtering options to limit or filter the kind of RPCs you want to log. We also have provided a filter to filter the kind of events you want to log. 
And finally, there is a probabilistic sampler configuration where you specify the sampling rate. So with 0.5, uh, uh, it will uh, send only 50% of the calls which are randomly selected uh, to be uh, for generating the trace data. And now one more thing about observability, uh, there is something called tags, uh, which are uh, labels attached to the lot and metric data. Uh, we automatically attach location tags, which identify the location or source information of where the data was generated. For example, the VM name or the Kubernetes cluster name or the namespace. We also allow the user to provide additional custom tags that could be used to provide additional uh, identification information such as the app ID or the data center uh, and so on. Uh, this is a screenshot of the consumer dashboard. As you can see, we automatically provide suggested queries based on the suggested data uh, from the uh, based on the ingested data and clicking on a suggested query will generate that dashboard. Uh, for example, log records of GRTC that had errors. Uh, this is a screenshot of a log record of one of the GRTCs that failed with the deadline exceeded error. Uh, this screenshot of a log record shows the location and custom tags called labels uh, here. The location tags have the cluster name, pod name, project ID, and so on. The custom, custom tags contain the app ID and data center as supplied by the user's environment or the configuration. Uh, for GRPC observability, uh, we have already released the logging feature in private preview. Uh, the metrics and traces are coming soon, uh, almost as we speak. Uh, these will be integrated with Google Cloud monitoring and trace. Uh, this is a screenshot of the upcoming metrics part of observability. You can filter by specific workloads, such as the VM name uh, or VM instances, or by uh, location or custom tag. Uh, so that wraps up the whole presentation. Uh, before closing, uh, I would like uh, those of you who are interested uh, to know more about uh, anything I have mentioned here, or if you just want to meet the GRPC maintainers, you can go to grpc.io slash meet uh, to submit a form and uh, to get started. Uh, grpc.io uh, is a good starting point to get more information about GRPC. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions.